how you communicate. Look, I don't have a wedding ring on, but every woman on that workplace knows I'm married. And I'm not interested. How do they know that? Because of my actions. And if they don't get to know me within the first few seconds of me talking to a female, I'm discussing and talking about my wife. My conversation, my behavior lets them know I am married. Okay? So your behavior, your conversation says you're married. I'm married. I'm married to the king. Jumping down to Hebrews chapter 12, verses 11 through 15. Now, no chastening for the present seemed to be joyous. Chastening means discipline. Spanking. When daddy puts you over his knee, you know, he says this hurts me more than this hurts you. <laughs> we all question that until we become adults. And then we know our heart's breaking while we're... Amen. So, now, no chastening for the present seemed joyous. There's nothing fun about getting this man. But grievous, nevertheless, afterward, it yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness, which means right living. Okay? Unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down at the feeble knees. And do what? Make straight paths for your feet. You make your path straight. You discipline yourself to be right before God. The angels going to miraculously make you live right. You'll have a desire to please Him. And because of that, you'll start learning how to please Him. Now, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. You can't even see the Lord if you don't. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness. So we were dealing with some roots of bitterness tonight. And we all deal with it. Trust you me. Even with the Holy Ghost, we have to watch out for roots of bitterness. Springing up, troubling you, and thereby many be defiled. Now, the word holiness here is near the same as hygiasmos, which means properly purification, sanctification. It is a process. We grow in holiness. We don't get there overnight. It's a process. We learn over time. This, okay, you don't like that, so I won't do that anymore. You move on. Oh, you don't like that, so I won't do that anymore. You move on. You feel a strong conviction. You shouldn't go there. You shouldn't do that anymore. You begin to grow as you listen and have conversations with Him. You learn to live holy as He is holy. He pulls you into His world. Right. Thank you. He helps separate you from yours. James, and this is where I'm going to end tonight. James chapter 4, verse 6 through 10 says, <clears throat> But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud. Now the scripture interpretation of that is, God aligns himself like an army against you that are proud. Now, you line up against me, or you line up against me is one thing. But if God turns Himself against me, where am I, who am I going to get help from? Who's going to stop that? Who's going to prevent that? So, God resists the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. And here's what's key. Verses 7 through 10 are very key. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Step 1. Submission. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, there's a whole lot of folks running around saying, get you behind me, Satan. But they haven't done step one. What's step one? So you can't go commanding the devil to get behind you if you're not submitted. You can't rebuke the devil and he's not going to go nowhere because you have no authority because you're not under authority because submission brings you under authority. And when you're under authority, authority flows through you. That's why when you're submitted, you can resist. And it has to go. You don't even have to put up much of a fight. I ain't dealing with you today. It's gone. Submit. And then resist. Draw nigh to God. And he will draw nigh to you. Nigh means near. So you draw near to Him. He draws near to you. Now notice it doesn't say He will draw nigh to you. So why don't you go ahead and draw nigh to Him. That ain't what it says. It says you 
draw nigh to Him. You've got to move toward Him. You've got to position your mind toward Him. You've got to make up your mind, Lord, start reading my Bible. I'm going to start praying. And when you do those things and you set aside time for those things, you're drawing your spirit near to Him. You're stepping into His world. And when you do that, He gets drawn into what you're doing. And so as you draw near to Him, He draws near to you. Cleanse, now this is important. He says, cleanse your hands, you sinners. So basically, if you're a sinner, you have dirty hands. Or you have hands that need clean. Right? And here's what's key. And purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Now, what's a double-minded person? Someone who can never make up their mind. I'm in, I'm out. I'm in, I'm out. I'm going, I'm not going. I'm going to this, no, I ain't going to do this. I'm going to, uh, next, uh, I don't know what I'm going to do. You tell me what to do because I don't know what to do. They're going nowhere but circles. Do I go forward? Do I go back? Right? I'm going to uh, I'm go back uh, forward. And really, you haven't gone anywhere. And the Bible says that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You're unstable. You're not, you're not standing. You're not strong. You're not moving forward. You're unstable. You're rocking. Your world is messed up. But what does it say? How do you get that way? Because your heart is impure. So how do you fix your double-mindedness? You have to purify your heart. How do you purify your heart? Well, let's keep reading. Be afflicted. Here we go back to chasing here again. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Because you realize, man, I'm double-minded. i got issues. I'm a sinner. I need to be cleansed. You, you need to weep. When you realize, when you come to the place where you realize, I'm a sinner and I need God, there ought to be some weeping showing. Sure. There ought to be some heaviness in your spirit. There ought to be some, when you get in the presence of God, you either want to run out the door or you want to run to an altar or you want to weep. Because you know there's something wrong with me. I, he's so holy and I feel so unclean. And so, let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaven. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He shall lift you up. Dirty hands, cleanse your hands, you sinners. Dirty hands are guilty hands. When Pilate had Jesus crucified, he wrestled with the decision all night long. His wife had nightmares. When it was all said and done, and he told him, you, just, you do it, I'll let, whatever you say, I'll let you do it. He tried to throw it off himself onto them, but he was still the one in authority. And so then the, they say in history teaches, uh, uh, Josephus teaches that he became consistently fixed on wringing his hands. He was constantly going through the motion of like he was washing his hands because his mind was racked with what he did. He knew Jesus was innocent. He knew he wasn't guilty and deserved a cross. He knew that. And he couldn't get away from that unclean feeling. He kept wanting to wash his hands. And that's where we can get when we're in the world we finally reach a place where we know we need God. Every time I turn around, I'm messing up. The power of living this way and all that. What do I have to show for my life at this stage? Nothing. I need God. I need God to fix me. I need Him to help me. And so we have to cleanse our hands. And and our and for some of you this might be too much, but I'm gonna say it for those of you who know what I'm talking about. When you go back to the old tabernacle, and I'm right the door. When you go back to the old tabernacle, when they had to offer sacrifices, they brought that burnt lamb, they brought that lamb in there, they placed it on an altar, they slid, they put their hand on his head while the throat was slit and the blood ran out. That lamb was taking their place for their sins. They were guilty, not the lamb. And they had to sit there with their hands on his head and confess their sins that year out loud to the priest and to everybody around them. And what happened next was after they had to slip, they were supposed to do what? Go wash in the labor. But the high priest, he'd go, he'd go wash his hands and the, the brazen labor and wash his hands. So the washing of the hands signifies this cleansing process. So you have to cleanse your hands, you sinners. Understand that when he talks about purifying your heart, your heart is not just out of here. When the scriptures talk about your heart, he's talking about 
really and truly, he's talking about your emotions. He's talking about your thoughts. He's talking about you that are housed in this body. That is your heart, your being, your motives, your emotions, your thoughts, your ideals. That's your heart. That's your heart. He said, purify your heart. In other words, impurities in the heart or in your spirit, your mind, they'll begin to cloud your ability to focus. And that's what causes confusion. You know, what's, you can't hardly make a decision. You don't know what's left and what's right. And he says, purify your hearts, ye double-minded. And we do that by making up our mind. You know, the scripture says, put this mind, put on the mind of Christ. Take his mind, put it on you. Take up his mind. What was his mind? He was going to lay down his life for everybody else. He was selfless, not selfish, like our country teaches. Him. How many times have you heard, you deserve this? You deserve it. You deserve better than that. You deserve, you deserve, you, you know what we deserve? We deserve hell. For the wages of sin is death. That's what we really deserve. But Jesus came so that we didn't have to go there. So that we didn't have to endure that death. He took it for us. Thank you, Lord. So because He took it for us, we don't have to go there. But we don't deserve heaven. We don't deserve His mercy. We don't deserve His blessings. But America teaches you deserve this and you deserve that and you ought to have this. It's that entitlement mentality. The only entitlement you ought to have is, Lord, your word said that if I do this, then you're going to do this. So I'm doing this, now I'm expecting you to do this. That's the only entitlement the kingdom of God. Okay? So this, this is Holiness 101. This is the simple stuff. This is the mind stuff. This is the mind stuff. And I think I'm going to start there unless I get really deep in it. Um, some of you were dealing with fear and torments and dreams. <clears throat> the scripture teaches us that perfect love casts out fear. Fear is the opposite of faith. Now, fear is the opposite of love. Some will teach you that the opposite of faith is fear. But that's not true. The opposite of faith is doubt. The opposite of faith is unbelief. The opposite of love is fear. That's why this country pushes a spirit of fear. Man, before that election, every one of us was dealing with fear. What's going to happen? Good Lord, they're going to declare martial law. We're going to lose everything. We better get ourselves together. And there is a healthy fear, but only when it's fear or reverence unto the Lord. But when your fear is placed in anything else, it's actually idolatry. It's actually adultery. It's, it's still faith in a sense and that it's placed in the wrong place. And so fear torments you. Love doesn't torment you. Fear torments you. And you've got to learn. These are your inlets. What you watch feeds your spirit. What you read feeds your spirit. And my wife can tell you when she first came into the church, I was explaining to Sister Jessica this, when she first comes to the church, she just she would go on uh, horror film binges over, oh, you know, those little marathons y'all do. She would go on a marathon of horror. Ate it up. But when she came to the Lord and He filled her with the Holy Ghost, she repented of all that. And then He starts fixing her. And she couldn't watch those. The Lord wouldn't let her watch those movies anymore. you, you got to put that away. And she didn't understand. You know, she's adjusting. And she put them away. And the next thing you know, she, she had a series of weeks of sweating dreams and nightmares just waking up in a drench. And she was praying, what are you, what's going on? And the Lord said, I'm purging you. Why was she sweating? Because fear moves in every part of your body. People that deal with shakes and jerks and all these things, that is the spirit of fear at work in their body somewhere. Every disease, every Every uh, phobia. Another word for fear. We've, we've named it. We categorize it. So we don't call it what it is anymore. All these diseases. Some of them are demons. Uh, they're bipolar. No, you bi-spirited. <laughs> you 
got two spirits working in you. You need to decide which one you, which one's gonna win. Take this medicine. No, that's going to add another spirit. <laughs> the only spirit you need is the Holy Ghost to push that spirit out and you won't need no medicine. Yeah. Look, this world works for the enemy. The more bondage it can put you, the better. Because it keeps you from what you're supposed to be, pure and clean and growing. And purification and holiness is a process. You're not always going to get it overnight. There are things I'm going to teach you and you're going to read about and you're going to be like, whoa, I got it. I stop doing that. Really? I've been doing it all my life. What's wrong with that? And we'll question it. But then about six months down the road, looking for God to get closer to Him, you go, well, I'm not doing that. I don't even want to do that anymore. And you'll put it away yourself. You don't need somebody to tell you a bunch of rules. The Bible is not full of rules. It's full of guidelines. It's full of the yellow marks on both sides of the road. There's little bumpy things going, okay, when you get over here, you're going to feel this rattle. You're going to truck, uh, okay, I'm about to run off the road. That's right. That's what the, that's what the Word of God does. All right, man. Thank you, Jesus. That's what the, uh, man. <laughs> Brother Ed told my children that it was, uh, they helped keep blind people on the road. <laughs> <laughs> and my first question was, where are they going to drive them? <laughs> what about the car in front of them? But, and they, 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 they bought that little line of But it's like that living for God. You have to have God line because we have flesh that wants to do every heinous thing in the book. And if you give it just a little room, it'll take a mile. But as you rein it in, like this says, rein in, keep your path straight for your feet. You tell yourself what you are and aren't going to do. You, I'm, I'm serious. Uh, no, we ain't watching that. No, we ain't going over there. No, Jeff Palmer, you can't do this. You tell yourself what you will and will not do. Let the Spirit of God lead you. And that's why there's really no point into digging into all the specifics of what you can and can't do, what's a sin and what ain't a sin sometimes until you are born again of the Spirit and you are entered into the kingdom because the Scripture says you cannot see the kingdom or you cannot understand the kingdom until you are in the kingdom. There are people that will that know, that can quote this Bible from one end to the other, but because they don't have the Spirit of God in them, they can't really understand it. That's why we have so many left behind families so full of false doctrine. Full of false thoughts. Why? Because they don't have a spirit leading them. They got their human spirit trying to figure out what he was saying over here in Cad Rod and all. And most of it's typology. Some of it's him speaking in parables. Didn't he speak in parables when he was on the earth? Why would he speak in parables in the book of Revelation? Then images, imagery that we can understand. You think those guys back in Daniel's day knew what a helicopter was? Yet you can read the description of a flying grasshopper with men's faces? <laughs> what? Because if they saw if they lived down and they saw a helicopter, sure enough, it looks like a grasshopper, it's flying, and there's two men's faces in each window right there. It's God works that way. Because there's stuff he saw way back then that you need, right? But back then they didn't have helicopters. So how does he tell you about a helicopter that can shoot with a dragon's tail? He said, about the scorp tail of a scorpion. What was that about? I mean, he's got some missiles coming up out of that helicopter. Coming out of his tail. But hey, he had nothing about that back then. So he told them in parables. He told them in imagery that they could understand and relate to. So that when now we're reading it, it takes the Holy Ghost to go, Oh, that's a helicopter. <laughs> With missiles and nuclear warheads. But we do. Right? So that's why this is the living word. It's been written. But when you are full of the Spirit, because he said, What? He seeketh such to worship him in spirit and in truth. You can't do it with just truth alone because you need the Spirit to interpret. 
The same God that said, write this is the same God that spoke this. So when He gets inside of you and you're reading it, He can speak it to your spirit, what it really means. When Jesus would pull His disciples over and said, now let me explain unto you what I said to the people. Even they couldn't understand it until He pulled inside and the Bible said He, he would open their understanding. So there are some things we're just not ready for until the Spirit of the Lord opens our understanding. And so I'm glad that the Holy Ghost moved in here and touched a whole bunch of y'all because I was going, how far do I really go with this, Lord? We've got a bunch of new people in here. They don't know all this stuff yet. They don't need to know all this stuff yet. Because it'd be confusing to some of us. Stand with me. You know, I said, wrapping up. I didn't pull a five-man to a ten, though. <laughs> I just know my wrapping up means 12. No. <laughs> now don't, don't put that in concrete. I'm speaking in parables. <laughs> but so glad y'all came. We're thankful for those of you that touched that claim that stuff. We're going to seal it in the spirit right now what God said. Those stubborn yes. problems. It's, it's funny y'all had the same problem. Same as you said years ago, yours was going back into your ovarian and your uterus. And you didn't tell me that, but he did. So if he exposes, if he reveals it, he'll heal it. Why else? Why else would you tell a stranger an issue unless you want to do something about it? So you need to believe that what God says he's going to do, he's going to heal it. If he reveals it, he's going to heal it. Come on, let's just pray one more time. Jesus, we love you, Father. We thank you, Lord, for the moving of your spirit. We thank you, Lord, for stirring our hearts and our hearts tonight, God. We thank you, Lord, for the healing that you loosed in this house tonight, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the refilling of the Holy Ghost in these that are here tonight. I seal every word that you have prophesied and you have spoken in the hearing of your people tonight. I seal every work, every healing, every ministry, God, that took place in this building. I seal it in the name of Jesus. And by your spirit, oh God, it is sealed. And it will be accomplished in the time that you have set it forth to be accomplished. We claim it and we thank you for it. We give you praise for it. We give you glory for it. Lord, I take this word. Take this word that we've heard. I pray, oh God, that you will seal it in our hearts. And we will begin to walk in the holiness of that we would begin to seek after your face, that we would begin to understand your ways, because we've learned our ways don't work and don't get us anywhere. I need your way, Jesus. I need your way. Ah, teach us, Lord. Teach us, teach us, teach us. Show us. Move in your time and your will and your place, oh God. Walk, oh God, in us and through us. Lord, for those of us who have this bitterness, these seeds of bitterness that you have exposed in our spirit tonight, God, I pray that you would give each of us wisdom, that you would enlighten our mind and our heart. I pray, God, that you would reveal to us over the next few days until Sunday, Lord, reveal to us people that we need to forgive. And I pray, God, that you give us mercy and grace to be able to call their name forgive them and release them and just love them and ask that you would move in their life oh God so that not only will they be free but oh God that I will be free that each of us who have this bitterness will be free to move in your spirit be free to have a flow of your spirit ah oh, we give you praise we give you all glory we give you glory in Jesus name in Jesus name in Jesus name Amen we thank you Father Let's clap our hands on the